Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the lunch and the beautiful weather. So I'm delighted to now welcome Christine Edwards, who is the Stephen and Camilla Bauer Brower Conservation Geneticist at the Missouri Botanical Gardens in St. Louis. So Christine Edwards leads the Conservation Genetics Lab and also runs the Conservation Genetics Research Program in Missouri Botanical Garden. She holds an adjunct professorship at Washington University in St. Louis. University of Missouri, St. Louis, and St. Louis University. So, Christine's going to talk to us today about how we can better target our conservation efforts by applying conservation genetics to conservation questions. So, I'm delighted to welcome Christine Edwards here, and I'm really looking forward to her talk. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you. All right, thank you, um, first of all, to the organizers of the conference for inviting me here. It's a really big honor to come and talk to you guys about conservation genetics. And I'm going to kind of shift focus from kind of the big conservation issues to more um, using science for um, specific conservation questions. OK, so um, to start off with, I'm going to start with a brief overview of conservation genetics and um, give you a, a kind of in detail um, overview of the conservation genetics program at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about a few examples of how genetic data can make conservation efforts more effective. And I've kind of tried to tailor these to botanical gardens. Um, so there are things like devising conservation strategies to, to protect the full range of genetic diversity in a, a rare species, um, clarifying taxonomy and species limits, and then assessing the conservation value of living collections. Okay, so it will come as no surprise to many of you that, that most biologists believe we're in a, a biodiversity crisis. Um, and so this is a, a graph from a paper that was published in 2015. And essentially what they did is they looked at the, the background extinction rate in the, the fossil record, and then they compared it to the extinction rate that we're currently seeing. And on the x-axis there, you see that's um, the extinction rate from about 1500 to the current day. And what they found is that for animals, that the, the current ex species extinction rate is between 100 and 1,000 times greater than the background rate based on the fossil record. And um, the causes of this are competition with one species, um, humans. And uh, we do all kinds of things to cause the extinction of species, like um, destruction of natural ecosystems, unsustainable use of species, and climate change. And so th this paper was um, based in, in animals, but we see the same thing happening in plants. Um, so clearly, we all know that conservation is important. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. Um, but that, that, other, that previous um, uh, graph showed species extinction. And um, there's, there's issues with extinction at all levels of biodiversity. So biologists recognize three fundamental levels of biodiversity. Um, these are ecosystem diversity, which just refers to the, the diversity of, of ecosystems and ecosystem processes. Um, the second is species diversity, which is, I, I think is the most commonly recognized form of biodiversity. But what I work on is, is genetic diversity, um, which is essentially the, 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 raw material, the, the raw material that produces the physical and functional differences among individuals within a population. Um, and, and genetic diversity really provides um, the ability, or it's thought to confer the ability of a species to withstand stress. Um, so, for example, if you have a genetically diverse population and it faces a disease, it's more likely to uh, be able to have a genetic variant that can withstand that disease, um, as opposed to a species that has low genetic diversity where they might not necessarily have the, the genetic raw material to, um, to withstand a disease. And so, um, essentially, the way genetic diversity is thought is that it's um, a mechanism that promotes resilience and an adaptive potential. <clears throat> 
Um, and I just want to point out that these three levels of biodiversity are, are interconnected, um, and so it's important to conserve all of them. So, you know, if you get a loss of gene in genetic diversity, it can in kind of predispose a, a species to extinction. Um, if you get losses in species, then it can destabilize ecosystems, and the destabilization of ecosystems can feed back on um, the the genetic diversity. And so we need to make sure that we're conserving all the levels of biodiversity. Um, and I think this is, this is recognized in many of the, the conservation targets of like the international policy, uh, conservation policy. Um, I think I could argue that genetic diversity is probably the least represented in some of these, these uh, targets, but um, I think that could be a, a, a topic of future conversation for things that we need to think about in the future. Um, but I think one of the things that hampers our ability to conserve is that we, we have an incomplete knowledge of biodiversity. So at the species level, um, there's a lot of species out there where we're not 100% certain if they're valid species, they're, they could be taxonomically questionable. Um, and then there's also a lot of out the species out there that are cryptic. Um, they could be um, their own species with their own evolutionary fate, um, and we just don't recognize them, and they may, may be in need of conservation. Um, at the, the genetic level, um, we can't observe genetic diversity in a population. You can't just go out and measure genetic diversity or look at, at genetic diversity in the field. And um, there's all kinds of factors that can affect genetic diversity. Um, so these are things like the demographic history, the life history strategy, the, the mating system. And, and so um, I would argue that... Um, an effective knowledge or a accurate knowledge of genetic diversity is important so to, for conservation. Um, and so that's what conservation genetics does, is it really um, uses genetic data to provide a high resolution picture of both genetic and species diversity. Um, and, and in that way, it can facilitate conservation. Okay, so here is a, a slide that shows all of the, the current projects that we have going on in the Conservation Genetics Laboratory at the Missouri Botanical Garden. And we, we have a very broad taxonomic focus, um, and we also work on all different kinds of life forms, including trees, shrubs, um, aquatic plants. Um, but the general theme that unites all of our projects is that we work on species of conservation concern. So. Um, within the United States, um, usually that means that we work on species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so species that are listed are endangered or on the brink of extinction and need immediate help, so they're very threatened. Um, and species listed as threatened are close to the brink of extinction. Um, and then with international projects, we work on species that are generally listed under the red list as critically endangered or endangered. Um, and, and clearly the reason why we work on these species is because they're, they're the ones that are, are really on the brink of extinction and they need the most work on them to make sure that they don't go extinct. Um, so the way projects in my lab normally work is that we have um, partners, um, like government agencies that are tasked with managing endangered species, um, state agencies that, that manage specific um, populations, um, and then in international projects we have uh, local partners. And these people come to us and they have questions about um, the, the genetic diversity of specific species of interest. And so we'll usually work together to find funding to work on a species. Um, and then we answer a kind of a, a, a range of questions, and these include things like the basic biology of the organism, like the mating system and other life history characteristics. Um, we use genetic data to understand the best strategy protects genetic diversity in an endangered species, both in situ, in situ or ex situ. Um, we will analyze data, to, genetic data to understand um, patterns of genetic connectivity among, among populations to see is something a unique species and, and deserving of protection, or is it a subpopulation of a more widespread species? Um, we will look at um, how much genetic diversity is present in ex situ collections to see how well it reflects the diversity in the wild. And then we can use that information to guide reintroductions to ensure they have high genetic diversity. Okay, so um, 
I have a team of people that work with me, and so I'm lucky to have some, some great technicians and students at neighboring universities that work with me in the lab and in the field. And so when we're out in the field, essentially what we do is we just um, go out and we collect multiple individuals from multiple populations of each species that we're working on. We also work in ex situ collections. Um, and then we take our, our collections back to the lab and we extract DNA, um, we prepare samples for, for genotyping or, or sequencing, um, and then we outsource all of our sequencing so we don't have any expensive sequencers that we have to maintain. And essentially then we, we get the data back and we just analyze the similarities and differences in the, the genetic data. And um, we use, use, use that to answer these questions. Um, so there's a lot of conservation work that is going on in botanical gardens. And I think that genetic data applies to many of these conservation questions. So these are kind of a, a list of the things that I think that we can use genetic data to do. And so, so now I'm essentially just gonna give you a, a overview of a few projects that, where we're using genetic data to make conservation efforts in botanical gardens more effective. Okay, so the first example I'm gonna give is a project where we're devising conservation strategies to protect the full range of genetic diversity in a species. Okay, so this is gonna focus on three species. Um, the first is Leavenworthia exigua on the left there, and that's a, a species in the Brassicaceae. The second is a Fisaria, also a species in the Brassicaceae. And then the third is Geocarpon minimum. And uh, these are all species that are, are found in the Midwestern US and they're all um, listed as, as threatened under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Um, and these species ha have a lot of similarities about them. Um, so they have similar habitat types, so they, they occupy rock outcrops or glades. Um, so they have a calcareous soil and then a very thin layer, or, or calcareous bedrock, and then a layer of, of soil underneath, uh, over it. Um, and the, their distribution is naturally fragmented because the, the distribution of the outcrops are naturally fragmented. Um, and these species are really threatened because of habitat loss, um, building, building uh, developments on their, their, their habitat, and then they're also affected by burning. And so the, the populations in the species are, are, all the three of these species are declining. Um, and they all have very similar life history characteristics. So they have, they're all winter annuals, they have um, an unknown mating system, or we didn't know when we started this work, and then um, they're all, they all have seeds that are gravity and water dispersed. Okay, so, so the question, so we were approached by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who's um, responsible for managing these species, and what they wanted to know is just what is the best way to ensure that the genetic variation in these species are protected um, in situ. And then in kind of a related question, I work really closely with a, a seed banking specialist at the Missouri Botanical Garden who's tasked with um, seed banking all of the species that are endangered or threatened in the, the Midwestern US, or many of them. Um, and so he wanted to know what the best strategy was for collections ex situ. And he wanted to know if we should be following the, the general guidelines put out by the Center for Plant Conservation. And this is that we should be collecting 50 maternal individuals from 50 populations. Um, so seeds from that many individuals, which is a lot of work, honestly. Um, and so he wanted to know if he could maybe do things in a little bit more of an efficient manner. So, so what we did is we went out um, and we collected in, uh, populations from each one of these species. We analyzed their genetic structure and we looked at the results and, you know, I, I, honestly, I expected we would find very similar patterns of genetic structure amongst these, amongst these different species. Okay, so this is the first species, it's Leavenworthia. And um, most species in this genus are selfers, so you see a lot of genetic structure, so lots of differences amongst populations. And so that was what we were expecting to find in the species. But when we actually went out and measured the genetic diversity, what we found is that all of the individuals in this species are genetically identical to each other. So essentially, there's no genetic diversity in the species at all. <laughs> It was crazy. Um, and, and the reason is because it's an apomix, and, um, which is essentially a, asexual reproduction via seed. And so my, my collaborate this, collaborate the, collaborator at the seed bank, he had already collected like 50 populations of this species. And so he wasted a ton of time and energy 
collecting these species when really the optimal strategy for protecting the genetic diversity of the species is to do, you could seed bank from one population and you could protect one population. Um, so, but this was completely unexpected. Um, the second species is Fisaria. And this species is in um, Missouri and Arkansas, and it has um, four scattered groups of populations. So um, it has some populations in southeast Missouri, and then two kind of in northern Arkansas, and one in, in central Arkansas. And we were expecting to see patterns of genetic structure based on these, these geographic patterns. And um, so essentially what we found, so this is a structure diagram. And so along the bottom there, you see those little labels. And that represents, so each one of those boxes above those labels represents the population that we sampled. And each one of the, the colors represents a genetically cohesive group. So the colors represent the groups of populations together that should be, that are our groups. Um, and essentially what we found is that, like we expected, the, the populations um, that were kind of scattered are genetically unique. And then um, within Missouri, we also found substructuring of genetic variation. So for this species, um, it's an outcrosser, but it looks like uh, genetic material is, is, is being transferred at a relatively short, or very small scale. And so the optimal strategy for protecting this species would be just to sample from each one of those, those groups of populations that are circled. Um, so so in, once again, um, in, in, in terms of in-situ, I would just, would just protect one of those populations each of these locations. Um, okay. And then the final species is Geocarpon. Um, and this species has um, a range in Missouri and Arkansas as well. And then it, it also goes down to Louisiana and Texas. And it, it also occupies two habitat types. So the, the populations in, in Missouri occupy sandstone glades. The ones in the southern part of the range occupy these things called saline barrens. And we were expecting to see you know, genetic structuring according to habitat type and maybe some of the geographic groups. Um, but what we found with this species is that it is a sulfur. So it self-fertilizes and it drops its, its seed underneath it and it's all genetically identical to itself. So every single individual in a population is genetically identical, but every single population is genetically different. Um, so in this species, um, you need to protect, in order to protect the genetic diversity of the species, you need to protect every single population. Um, and in terms of ex situ collections, uh, the kind of the optimal thing would be a very low collection effort in, in a population, one individual per population, but, but trying to, to get every single population. So, like I said initially, we kind of expected we would find similar patterns of genetic diversity and genetic structure in these species. And it turns out we found completely different patterns of genetic structure. Um, and so really, it, it kind of shows that the most effective strategy for conserving genetic variation uh, varies quite widely. And um, the kind of basic um, general conservation guidelines, in most of these cases here, in fact, every single case um, requires more effort than is required to protect the genetic diversity of the species. Um, so, you know, in terms of in situ collections, um, you know, the, the first species where you could, if you're trying to protect multiple populations to protect genetic diversity, you could be wasting a lot of money um, trying to do that when it's not going to add any additional genetic diversity. Um, so, in a lot of ways, I think that conservation of genetic diversity is, is best done using genetic data. Um, and it, it ensures that our, our work is efficient and effective. Um, and if you don't have genetic data, I think you can use um, kind of surrogates, like mating system in particular, um, to kind of do a better job of targeting populations so that you can protect the genetic diversity of the species. Okay, so um, second, I'm going to talk about uh, projects where we're clarifying taxonomy and species limits. So there is a lot of work in botanical gardens being done um, in, in order to document and understand plant diversity. Um, so I know a lot of you are working on the world flora online. A lot of you do conservation assessments of endangered species. Um, but, but I think um, one of the things is, is that I still think we don't necessarily have 100% accurate or knowledge of all the species on Earth. Um, so I'm going to show you two examples of how we use genetic data and found some unexpected results in terms of species diversity. 
Okay, so this is the Fisaria. It's the same species I just showed you um, earlier. And um, so the thing that we did with this is we, we analyzed our data in a, a slightly different way, which just shows the, the similarity or the differences amongst populations. So that tree on the left there shows that the little boxes are, are populations. And um, those, the branches on this tree are scaled to the similarity or differences among populations. So the closer they are, the more similar they are genetically, and the farther apart they are, they're more different. So basically what we found was mostly what we expected, in that all of the populations, um, most of the populations of Fisaria filiformis are genetically similar to each other. Um, but we also sampled an outgroup, and what we found was that um, populations in the southernmost part of the range are as genetically different from the rest of the species as the outgroup was. Um, and if you guys know population genetic statistics, um, our FST was 0.98. Um, FST ranges between zero and one, uh, with zero meaning there's no genetic connectivity, and one meaning that there's, or, or, uh, the opposite. Zero means that they're highly similar genetically, lots of gene flow occurring. Zero means there's none, and um, there's no gene flow. Um, so essentially what we're doing now is we're working to describe these species with an expert at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, but in this case, we, we found this new cryptic species that we didn't actually know existed previously. It was, com it was completely unexpected. Um, and then another example, which kind of shows the, the contrasting pattern. Um, so this is a species called Delphinium exaltatum. And this species has an interesting distribution. So it has a disjunction. The, the, the core of the populations of the species are in the Appalachian Mountains. And there's about a 400 kilometer disjunction between that and a group of populations in the Missouri Ozarks. Um, and this is in the Midwestern US. And um, so, Based on this distribution, um, we were approached by a, a person from the National Park Service who was managing the populations in the Missouri Ozarks. And he was convinced that the Ozark populations should be described as a new species. And so what we just did is we went out and said, okay, well, let's look at the genetics and see if it, it supports that. Um, so we just wanted to know whether they're genetically distinct in the Ozarks and um, whether they represented a, a unique species. Um, but when we went out and we actually did the genetic work, you know, we sampled multiple populations across the range. And uh, what we found, um, so essentially here's another genetic distance tree. And so what we found was that the, the populations in Missouri, the Missouri Ozarks um, are actually more closely related to the populations in Tennessee than um, either are with populations in the Central Appalachians. So even though Tennessee populations and the Central Appalachians populations are geographically more, more similar, um, they are genetically not more similar. So um, I think that just goes to show that you, you can't necessarily predict what you're going to find genetically in terms of uh, populations or species diversity. Um, and actually the reason why we think that, that we see this pattern is because it looks like they, the, there has been a, a period of recent climate change and that kind of area where the, there's no populations in between the Ozarks and Tennessee. It looks like um, the, the, the climate recently changed and, and has made that intervening area un, um, unlivable for the Delphinium. So, um, but anyhow, so um, basically they're not a separate species even though we thought they were definitely going to be. So. Um, but essentially, I just want to show you that the genetic data can provide really unexpected results um, into, into the species diversity. And, and that, uh, this is important because I think um, it it's, it's, will help to make sure that we're, we're um, spending our conservation funds wisely. So we want to make sure that we're protecting species that are indeed endangered and, and unique, like the, the new species um, of Fisaria. Um, where there's only three populations of that species that we know of. Um, and, and on the other hand, we want to make sure that we're, we're not protecting species that are, that are not unique, like in the case of the Delphinium and the Ozarks. Okay, and then finally, um, I'm going to show you a project where we are using genetics to assess the conservation value of living collections. Um, okay, so this is a project that focuses on a species called Dracaena brachylifera. Um, this is a species that was described in 1797 from a living plant that was cultivated in the uh, botanical garden in Europe. 
And um, it was based, the description was based on this distinctive inflorescence. Um, so Dracaena ambraculifera has this kind of almost umbel-like, um, like really compact inflorescence that kind of nestles into the base of the leaves. Whereas most Dracaena species have these big diffuse paniculate inflorescences. Um, and the, the, the specimen on which the, the description of the species was based was attributed to the island of Mauritius, which is an island out in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Um, but subsequent searches over the last century have not relocated the species. And so it was listed as, as extinct by the IUCN Red List in 1988. Um, however, this was a bit, of, a bit surprising to us because we actually have an accession in our living collections that's called Dracaena and Brachylifera. And so we started to question whether that status as extinct was really accurate. And actually, when we did a plant record search of the BGCI database, we found that um, a total of 18 gardens have accessions of plants that they call Dracaena and Brachylifera. Um, however, for, for I think all of these, the identification of them is questionable because they don't really regularly flower in greenhouses, and so we don't have a, a confirmation of their identity. You really need to have an inflorescence. Um, and not only that, like nobody actually knows where any of these accessions originally came from. Like they don't have an a, a original collection location in, in the wild. Um, so, so basically what we set out to do with this project was just try to figure out what was going on and, and with this species. Um, like where did it originate? You know, what species is it most closely related to? Is it really extinct? Um, and do botanical gardens have correctly identified specimens? And, and, and do they have any, any conservation value? Um, so basically what we did is we got accessions from plants all over the world. I, I think probably a lot of you actually provided samples for our study. <laughs> um, and so we got samples from plants from places all over the world. We also went to Mauritius and collected all of the extant species of Dracaena that we could find. And we didn't find Dracaena and Brachylifera, but um, it was brought to our attention that a gentleman had a living plant in his garden that was obviously correctly identified based on the inflorescence that you can see there. And he told us that um, he had always had this plant in his, in his garden. And, and so that led us to believe that maybe the species was really from Mauritius and extinct, and that this could be one of the last individuals left. Um, we were also able to get a um, sample from a botanical garden. So this is a, a specimen that was made in the 1800s. And we think it was actually made from the original plant that the species was based on, or the description of the species was based on. Um, and so these two were used as a reference to compare all the, the garden samples to see if they were correctly identified. Okay, so, so essentially what we did is then we took all these samples, we sequenced their DNA, and we also got some um, DNA information, so you downloaded sequences from GenBank from a bunch of species from Madagascar. Um, and so this is a phylogeny of the group, and I've color-coded this so that you can kind of see, see what's going on. So the green are the cultivated accessions, the, the, the darker blue are wild um, individuals from Madagascar. The turquoise is um, accessions from Mauritius. And then the black are just outgroups. Okay, so the two correctly identified accessions of Dracaena and Brachylifera are indicated with the arrows there. And so we know that some of the botanical garden accessions are not correctly identified. They cluster down there with the outgroups. Um, and they're probably not even Dracaena. Um, there are... Um, some accessions that are closely related to the Dracaena and Brachylifera. We don't have a lot of resolution there, so we can't for sure say that they are or are not. Um, but the thing that was most striking about our tree was the, the fact that here's all the accessions from Mauritius and Turquoise, um, and we were expecting the Dracaena and Brachylifera to group with them, given that it's supposed to be from Mauritius. But it turned out that we actually found that it was grouping with Dracaena reflexa from Madagascar. Um, and so this started to lead us to the conclusion that maybe the species was from Madagascar, but we didn't really know what was going on. Um, and then the next thing we found was a, um, somebody brought to my attention this post from the gentleman who had the living accession of the plant in his garden. And he says, please help me identify this plant. It lives on an island on the northeast coast of Madagascar on an island of St. Marie. And he basically showed a picture of the, the specimen of his Dracaena and Brachylifera. 
So this started to get us thinking that maybe it actually was from Madagascar. And this was kind of confirmed by our genetic data. So we went out and we looked for it. We have a big program in Madagascar. And we actually found living, living extant populations of the species in the wild in Madagascar. Um, there's a, five populations. And I actually, I just found out that that number is, is incorrect. There's 47 individuals left. So it should actually be listed as um, critically endangered. But it's not extinct, right? So that's uh, good news. And how often do we get really good news in terms of conservation? <laughs> um, so, so the cool thing about this is that um, the genetic analysis of these, these ex situ collections led us to the rediscovery of the species that was last seen by botanists like 250 years ago and was presumed to be extinct. Um, and this genetic analysis really, I think, can bring new value to accessions in botanical gardens. You know, I think everybody thought that these Dracaenas had no conservation value. And I think this shows that they actually do. You know, even these undocumented collections, genetic data can help and kind of elucidate where they came from and, and what they're useful for. Um, and I think this approach will probably facilitate new discoveries in the future. OK, so um, overall, um, I. My point today was to show you how genetic data can provide important and often unexpected results that you wouldn't necessarily gain just by looking at the distribution of species or the morphology. Um, and I, th I think this information in all of these cases helps us to ensure that our conservation efforts are efficient and more effective. Um, you know, because there's a lot of species out there to conserve. And so we want to make sure that we're doing things the, the, in the most efficient way possible so that, um, you know, we're not wasting a lot of money protecting extra populations when we don't necessarily have to do it, for example. Um, so I want to point out also that um, this approach, I think, works best in collaboration with conservationists who work on the ground and have questions about the management of the species. And so, and so in that way, I think it's, it's um, ideally suited for conservation programs and botanical gardens because I think that the conservation biologists really, uh, are, the conservation biologists in botanical gardens are really doing a lot of the important work in terms of conservation. And I, I think, um, adding this extra element of genetics, I think really can, can help make sure that we're protecting as many species as we can, doing the best, the best science in an effective and efficient manner. So I hope more of you will start to um, employ genetic approaches in your, in your conservation work. And also, um, you know, consider even maybe developing a conservation genetics program if you don't have one. All right, so um, with that, I have lots of acknowledgments. I'm not gonna mention everybody, so thank you. So we have five minutes for questions for Christine. I'd just like to say it was a very, very interesting talk. It gets right into the science. And there's two things that I've taken home from this talk, or will take home from this talk. Firstly, is nothing is as it seems. <laughs> and secondly, there's a chapter waiting for the new GSPC on conservation genetics. So, thank you very much. I'll hand over to you for questions. You talk about the um, balancing the effort of collecting seed with um, being informed by the DNA evidence. What, what is, what is this, the timeline and the process like for getting decent amounts of genetic data from a population and what's the prospect for streamlining that so it could actually be a timely uh, conservation tool? Yeah, well, so... I mean, in my lab, we can, we can go out and collect a population um, and analyze the genetic data and have results like within a season. Um, and, so, and I guess you kind of have to balance that with seed banking from rare species. So there, there's a lot of effort that goes into it. So for example, um, seed, seed phenology can be hard to, to, to judge, for example. So like, for, for example, like, you might go out and the population isn't ready to be collected from. So you might have to visit the population three or four times, right, um, before you can actually collect the seed. And then a lot of times these species are not doing that well. So, so collecting a ton of seed isn't really a great idea. And you might actually have to go out multiple times, like multiple growing season, in, to actually get enough seed for 50 individuals from 50 populations. So, so um, in terms of effort, 
um, it's it's more expensive in some ways, or it's, in terms of cost, genetic data is, 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 is more expensive, but I think in a lot of ways it's easier to get. Um, and the seed banking is, you, ha you really have to do the genetics beforehand, right? So, but, I, but I think if you have like two years, you can do the whole thing in two years. And, and, um, and I, I guess the other thing about this data is that you know, genetic data can inform in situ conservation as well as ex situ, right? So, so the probably the most conservation resources go into protect, like physically protecting populations, and so the genetic data can guide both of those. And and so, for example, in that that population of Leavenworthia, where all the individuals are genetically identical, they've spent a lot of effort trying to physically protect populations of that species so they can capture the genetic diversity. You know, they spent you know hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it turns out that there's no genetic diversity. So um, that money could have been spent in other ways, you know? So, so you know, a, a, a you know, $10,000 genetic study could have saved $100,000. Yeah. That's really beautiful research, thank you. I'm just wondering if you could comment maybe quickly, presumably all this was done with neutral uh, markers, mm -hmm. and you know, what are the limitations in thinking about conservation priorities, you know, recognizing that we may not be capturing genetic information that's actual relevant for the fitness landscape? Yeah, well, um, so we use both um, we use both microsatellites and RadSeq, um, and obviously with the microsatellites, that those are neutral markers. You know, with RadSeq, you can look for markers under selection and you know use those to see what the you know selective the the, the adaptive markers show. Um, I think um, so. So I mean, obviously, so. Neutral markers show, you know, kind of the, the historical patterns and the, the you know, the, the, the kind of um, neutral processes that shape populations, whereas the adaptive ones are showing selection. I, I think um, the, the main weakness of like the selective markers is that we don't have 100% evidence that they are actually under selection. But I do think that if you have both types of data, you should use it, right? And, and try to protect both um, elements of the genetic variation in the species. And I, th I think um, that probably provides a more holistic assessment of, of the genetic diversity in the species. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We should call a halt to questions. So Christine will be here and available during coffee and lunch to answer your questions. So I'd just like to say a big thank you to Christine. She set a scientific context and she showed us that nothing is as it seems. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's all right.